Hello again. Uh, today we're going to continue our discourse on the subject of thermodynamics. Uh, we've already uh, had a, one recording where we just did a bit of an introduction to the material that's, that supports the course. Uh, but today I want to get on to talking about the subject matter itself. Uh, thermodynamics is really quite a, an, an interesting subject very powerful subject, as we'll come to find out. Uh, it applies to uh, almost any of the sciences. This is what makes it uh, uh, so powerful. Uh, and the reason it does is because it focuses on energy. Uh, and without energy, you just simply can't do anything. So some of the subjects you will have met on your engineering program, such as fluids, uh, to drive fluid from one place to another, involves energy changes. Uh, structures, if you load a structure, energy changes are happening. Uh, and if you think more widely, uh, electrical engineering, nuclear engineering, biological, uh, all the sciences uh, require energy in one form or another. And when you know, when you know about thermodynamics, and learn about thermodynamics, uh, you will start to view the world in a slightly different way. Uh, there's a thermodynamic approach where we approach problems, and this approach is very powerful indeed. I can be applied to all these subjects that I mentioned. So I'm going to start off by giving a definition of what thermodynamics is. So let me just write that up if I might. Uh, so thermodynamics, uh, so let's say thermodynamics, thermodynamics, defines and describes the properties of energy and its transformation from one form to another. So this is some key words in there, which are energy, of course, uh, properties and transformation. So this is just a, a sentence which tells us overall what thermodynamics is about. Uh, we define properties a bit later on, but generally they're sort of an obser observable characteristic, some characteristic about the system that we're, we're looking at. Uh, energy, of course, we were met in mechanics, um, and transformation just essentially means change. From, um, uh, and in fact, in mechanics, you will have met transformations that take place. For instance, the interchange between potential and kinetic energy would be a, a, a typical transformation uh, that's um, pertinent also to thermodynamics. Uh, but we also have thermal, thermal issues to worry about, uh, which we will get on to that. Now, this is an overall statement. Thermodynamics itself is founded on four laws only, um, which again is quite remarkable because uh, with only four laws, the fact you can apply it to just about anything uh, is quite a powerful statement in its own right. So four laws, let's, so let's introduce these laws. So four laws. Um, so we're going to look at the laws in detail as we get into the course, of course. Um, but uh, just to, I'll mention them now here briefly. Uh, the first of these laws is called the Zerif Law. And we're going to talk about that today, in fact. So the Zerif law, uh, so called because the first law was already well established. Uh, so I'll bit, sneak this one in a bit later on. And <laughs> so they call this the Zerif law. And this law introduces the property, and it introduces the property temperature. So it introduces the property. temperature. 
call that T, and we're going to measure that with units of Kelvin. Um, we'll have to, we will talk in more detail about temperature, of course. We're going to get on to define it today, uh, but we really don't really, well, we don't get to the point of understanding and defining temperature properly until we get to the second law, uh, which is much later in the course. Yeah, but most people know what temperature is, yes. Uh, it's sort of a measure of hotness of, of things and coldness. Uh, but in a sense, it's really about microscopic activity. So, um, you know, the sort of the frenzy of, of which molecules move about that you can sort of temperature affects that, of course. Uh, so I had temperature, more more frenetic behaviour, if you like. For, but for thermodynamics, we're more interested in um, the macroscopic rather than the microscopic. Uh, because we're interested in big things, we're interested in power plants, we're interested in uh, conditioning units, refrigeration, these type of things, uh, which we will discuss on the course, uh, where the, the microscopic issues are probably something you're not too concerned about. However, in defining the properties of energy, uh, it's usually quite useful, I feel, to have a little bit of a good understanding of what the underpinning microscopic uh, 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 prop, uh, mechanisms are that are at play. So on the course, I will be talking about both the macroscopic and the microscopic, even though the way we create thermodynamics, the whole subject, uh, based on the four laws, doesn't require us to go and look at the microscopic, but I will say a little bit about that. The laws, in fact, uh, for thermodynamics are experimental based. So, um, in a sense, they've been observed thousands, of, if not millions of times. All the experiments I've found that we've done on the planet, uh, and even off the planet, uh, are found to obey the rules of thermodynamics. So we're pretty safe that they, you know, uh, that they do apply. Um, uh, so we can rely upon them, I think. Uh, so they are experimental based, but they are underpinned, as I say, by microscopic um, uh, atomistic type uh, mechanisms, so uh, so we, we're pretty we're pretty sure that the, the, the these these will uh, continue to work for us. Uh, so that's the zero law introduces temperature. The next one is the first law. So the first law, the first law of thermodynamics. Now this one introduces the property. Um, energy, energy, introduce the property energy, uh, the symbol U I'm going to use for that, and we're going to, the units I'm going to be measuring it with is kilojoules, okay. essentially joules, of course, SI unit, joule, um, but uh, the joule is quite small, so we're going to use kilojoules on this course, uh, so I'll generally have kilojoules in front of for, for energy. Uh, energy again as a microscopic uh, underpinning, uh, and in fact a mechanical underpinning. Uh, we can imagine it in a gas for instance to simply be the kinetic energies uh, for an ideal gas which we'll come on to later on. Um, they're simply the kinetic energies of the, of the particles in the gas, uh, the molecules. Um, so uh, but again, we find on the on this course on the um, uh, teaching classical thermodynamics, we don't in fact need to go to the, ma the microscopic view. We can we can get to this as with temperature from a macroscopic view. Um, it does the, the the problem with that. It tends to make things a little bit obscure. Uh, you wonder what it really what things really are. And this is the reason I say, look, it's probably a good idea as well, just to have a look at the microscopic as as part of a part of one's uh, discourse on these on these on matters. Zeroth law, first law of thermodynamics. The next one's a very famous law, very famous. The second law of thermodynamics. Uh, if you just mention the phrase second law, then everybody tends to know. Uh, they're talking about the second law of thermodynamics, it's, it's so famous. So second law introduces the, the property entropy. 
entropy s for that s i'm going to go use for that and it's going to be kilojoules per kelvin where are the units that we're going to be interested in well it's the units that we measure uh, entropy in uh, again entropy uh, we're going to introduce it and we we don't have to refer back to the microscopic but of course uh, it does have a, a microscopic underpinning uh, what are the particles doing uh, and it's essentially about mixing uh, and it gives a very it does give a clearer view if you know a little bit about the microscopic underpinning uh, aspects of, of of these of these properties um so we have the second law very famous law we're going to do it won't get it'll be much later in the course when we go on to that i do want to spend quite a bit of time on the second law uh and as i say uh the way i'm going to go through the course is the 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 uh the zero law and the first law i'm going to get through quite quickly most people have no problem with conservation of energy uh but when it comes to energy it's entropy things are a little bit more tricky. Um, so I'm going to go through quite quickly this, this material, uh, assuming that yourself are going to be reading about, reading the handbooks, reading the, the e-books that are provided for you, uh, fill in the gaps that I'm not going to cover or mention, but I will expect you to have read them um, because it's just knowledge. You're just gathering material and uh, it's, my time is better served, I feel, focusing on those subtleties that are really quite difficult to grasp uh, rather than just you know re relaying information that you, you could easily read uh, and get a better view of in fact by reading it uh, so there's three we've got the third law then the third law of thermodynamics now this law does not introduce a property uh, and it's about absolute zero it establishes a barrier to reach absolute zero so let's put that so establishes a barrier to reaching absolute zero, which is temperature, absolute zero Kelvin. So usually on in the, on the course when we look at properties, particularly energy and entropy, we're not too concerned about absolute values. So, you know, where the zero is and is it always positive? Um, uh, but on temperature, of course, we are. Temperature, we will, our T in Kelvin is the absolute temperature scale. Um, and also pressure. On this course, we're going to be measuring pressure in bar. Uh, so Newton, Newton per meter squared, of course. Uh, Pascal is the other alternative. We'll get onto that. But we're generally talking about absolute pressure. So always above zero, essentially. Uh, but for U and S, we're generally just interested in the change. Uh, but they do have absolutes. They do have absolutes. And I will mention a little bit about absolutes when we get onto it. There is thing, there's something called absolute entropy. Uh, and we can think about absolute energy as well. But they don't come from classical thermodynamics, these absolutes. Uh, the absolutes for energy comes from, in fact, Einstein was the guy who uh, defined energy in terms of mass. Uh, and the absolute for entropy comes from quantum theory, in fact, when you look at the, the states as you get close to absolute zero. So they're, they're slightly outside the subject. But worth having a little discussion about when we when we get to the yeah, just to get, fill in the gaps and give a complete understanding uh, of 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 this topic, which is a really exciting topic, as I say. So, in a sense, this slide here, this uh, whiteboard, if you like, which I've filled up, is thermodynamics, the overall view of it, um, the definition of it, and the laws that essentially underpin it. Experimental laws, admittedly. Um, uh, but um, but for all that, uh, really quite a powerful, really quite a powerful subject, as we will see. So to proceed, 
how do we move forward with this subject? This is the definition of it. Uh, we have to come up with some definitions. And it's a, it's a little bit boring, this part, but all this is laid out in the handbook for you. Uh, so I'm going to touch on it quite briefly because I want to get to the Zera floor today if I can uh, and introduce the first property. Um, but we need some definitions. Uh, and the first definition is uh, of a system. So let's, so definitions. So definitions. Uh, three three things I want to talk about. One is system. Uh, the other is property, of course. I want to define what a property is, uh, and also state a state of a system. Uh, so the first one, what is a system? Well, a system a system is a collection of matter. in a prescribed boundary, how about that? So, a system, so that's what a system is, it's a collection of matter in a prescribed boundary. Uh, so if I did a little, so, okay, there's a wiggly diagram, this is my system. Everything outside the system, we call the surroundings. I might as well talk about that as well. And this is my boundary. So we've got that. So in here, this is the matter, whatever that is. It could be a gas, some material. Uh, system sort, of, in a sense, focuses on the focuses on the uh, the thing, the thing, the matter. Uh, there is something you've already met, in fact, on your fluids course, which is a control volume. Control volume focus on space, and I'll get to that in just in a second. Uh, the subsets of this system, um, and uh, so let's have a look at what they might be. Uh, we have such a closed system, for instance. So a closed system. So what is a closed system? So a closed system uh, is distinguished by an absence uh, of matter, mass if you like, uh, and, um, flowing through, uh, through the boundary. So distinguished by, a closed system is distinguished by an absence of matter flowing through its boundary. So it is possible that you could have you know, as you can imagine in a fluids type situation, you can have matter flowing in and out of this thing. Uh, there's nothing stopping that. We can we can have that type of thing. So we can have stuff coming in, stuff coming out. And if you don't have anything flowing in and out of the system, um, then we call that a closed system. So it's very straightforward, I think. Well, an open system, of course, is the opposite of that. So we have an open system. So an open system, uh, what distinguishes an open system, it has matter flowing through uh, uh, across its boundaries. So let's just put it short as, uh, as matter flowing across its boundary. So that's a, an open system, uh, which we'll get on to. Uh, we will look at open systems on the course. A lot of the early stuff I'll be looking at closed systems uh, because we, we will be looking at what is known as equilibrium thermodynamics, where things move very slowly indeed. Uh, and I won't be thinking about 
matter flowing across the boundary. Uh, another type of system is an isolated system. Isolated. Uh, well, what distinguishes an isolated system is that you have no matter and no energy flowing across the boundary. So in this case, uh, there's no matter, no matter or energy or mass, I suppose, or energy flowing or passing, let's say passing rather than flowing, shall we? Uh, since it's energy <laughs> passing through its boundary boundary okay so they're the type of systems that we can have um, so it's just it's just opening up uh, uh, we might think about analysing uh, thermodynamic problems, we would identify the system. Uh, the first thing we do, uh, very much like, you know, if you were doing, if you were looking at uh, mechanics, the, tip, the starting point for mechanics is a three-body diagram. Here, the starting point for thermodynamics is the definition of the system. Uh, and typical systems, we could think of, let me just do... A sketch, maybe. Uh, this one where we could have a piston, and we've got some. There we go. So there's my piston, and inside there, we're going to have. We'll do it in red. Inside there, we're going to prescribe our boundary, really on the edges of the, of the cylinder. Uh, and this is my system, a closed system indeed. Uh, but there's a, an example of a closed system, uh, which in the in there, there could be some, could be gas, could be air. Well, it's a gas, yes. Uh, but it could be it could be anything really, any matter you like. And of course, we could we could imagine this changing its position. So we can imagine the piston going down. So it's going to be the same piston, it doesn't quite look like it, but there we go. So there's our piston again. We moved it in, and the system, the boundary, our prescribed boundary, there's no reason why we can't move the boundary. This is the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, the boundary has moved uh, as we moved the piston down. So that's still our system, but after all, it still contains the original matter. Uh, and that's a closed system. Um, well, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, systems are focusing on matter. Uh, the other thing that you were introduced to in your fluids course was control volumes. Uh, so, so, and when we apply control volume, it tends to be when we're looking at an open system, because open systems has matter flowing through it. So I can imagine, for instance, in a pipe maybe, so in a pipe, uh, we could decide to put our control volume inside the pipe. Yeah. We can put it also, well, I'm sure you, so there's our pipe, let's put some walls on this thing. And we've got some floor coming in. There's our floor. And of course, it's coming out, it's passing through uh, the control volume. This is our CV. So control volume, and this is out the boundary. Generally, we call that CS, which is the control surface. So control surface. Imagine it is three-dimensional. <laughs> well, my diagram is only two. Uh, so there's floor and matter. So the difference between a, a control volume and sort of a system uh, that we're, we've specified. The control volume focuses on space. It's a region of space. And in a sense, it's, it's a kind of a misnomer, you could argue. And that is just the fact that volume is sort of too, too um, 
there's two concepts kind of mixed up. One is that the volume is the size of something, so you know, ten meters cubed. It measures the you know the extent of the space, um, but also we think of volume as the space. So maybe control space might have been better, but it's it's there now. It's it's what we what we use. But it's a region of space and. Uh, uh, very powerful as well because a lot of the equations we look at uh, are based on uh, control volume concepts when we look at fluids particularly um, and of course uh, because it's a region of space it tends not to worry about where the system is in fact uh, though I put the control volume in the fluid here I could have equally put a control volume out contained in the fluid and the pipe because it's a region of space it, it doesn't care about <laughs> it, it alters the analysis when you when you do it but it's um, it's quite a it's a quite a powerful feature um so control volumes we will be using control volumes you met them in your fluid course i know uh, but also we're going to meet them on the thermodynamics course so they're systems uh but, and as i say the way we think about uh, the analysis of when we look at thermodynamics is we define our systems and the surroundings and, its, and the boundaries, they're the features. And in fact, if you look at these diagrams, the, the, the let me do it in red, but the external part, of course, if I just draw these straight lines off it, anything outside, anything outside the... Um, the system that I've defined is its surroundings. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it could be, the, it's got the piston, the cylinder, and all the rest of it, the rest of the universe, if you like. But that is the, you know, everything outside you is the surroundings. So we tend not to worry about that. The system is our prime focus. Um, as, uh, the, the bit we're interested in, the bit we define, the bit we're looking at. Um, uh, it, be, before we even start our analysis, this is, a, this is how we start our problems off uh, in thermodynamics. So, what's the next thing that I want to define? Well, we've got, we've got our uh, system. The next thing to look at is property. So, as we can imagine, with the system defined, uh, we want to look at uh, defining what's going on in the system. Uh, and what properties it might have. I don't know, I'm interested in that. Uh, <coughs> so what's property? Let's define this. Well, you probably guess what we, the kind of things we're interested in. Uh, so a property, we're going to give a very precise definition a bit later on, but before I get to giving the precise definition, uh, let's just give a, in broad terms, uh, the property is essentially an observer, observational, uh, observable, that's the word I was after, an observable characteristic. Uh, um, so we can think of in, in our system, uh, we might be interested in uh, the, the volume, for instance, so, so or, the, or, the, or the pressure maybe, that's a, another one that we might be interested in. And quite often in gas systems, pressure and volume are pretty important to us. Uh, and they're observable, aren't they, really? So, so in broad terms, then, uh, a property, or property, in broad terms, property, or Google that property, is an observable characteristic. of a system. So, um, well, this is not a precise definition, it's just a working definition at the moment. I'm gonna change it, uh, but it'll do for, do for, the, do for the time being. Um, we can subdivide properties into two types of properties. Well, a number of subdivisions, but let's have a look at two types, uh, which are internal, and external or mechanical and thermodynamic. So uh, can be subdivided then into uh, 
into two classifications, I suppose. Class uh, which uh, I internal which we call thermodynamic and external which we call mechanical so for an example then uh, mechanical well anything that you'd introduced on your mechanics course uh, uh, typical things so for mechanical so let's have a look uh, for examples for mechanical uh, we can think of position velocity kinetic energy ke potential energy pe uh, momentum and so on and so forth so these are clearly your observable characteristics of people the mass is flying across uh, mass let's put mass <laughs> mass is flying across the room there uh, we've got momentum it's got kinetic energy potential energy it's elevated it's in the gravitational field position where it is these are all uh, properties of that particular mechanical system. Uh, so these are mechanical, so they relate to this one. Uh, what about um, internal, thermodynamic? Why internal? Generally because it comes from the, the microscopic, uh, which is sort of defining the property, um, giving rise to the property. Uh, and so typical one for thermodynamic, uh, well, pressure, of course, pressure. As I said, on, our, on this course, pressure, the pressures we always think about is absolute. So if, forget about gauge pressure. Don't, don't go with gauge pressure. You probably met that on your fluids course, but uh, we're interested in absolute pressure. All the relationships we use uh, are based on uh, absolute pressure. Uh, what else? We haven't introduced it yet, but let's put it down. Temperature. And uh, clearly, uh, for thermodynamics, temperature is an extraordinarily important property. Uh, and, it, well, as we can see, it's the zero law. It's the basis of the zero law. Um, so, and it's the open and law, so clearly an important property for us. Um, pressure or volume, of course. Volume. Volume. Uh, so the space, the volume occupied by a gas clearly is a, it's an observable thing um, and a fairly important, a fairly important one uh, at that. So these are mechanical and uh, uh, thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamic um, properties. Uh, we can also subdivide again another classification. Uh, which is um, for our thermodynamic uh, properties, we can also subdivide them into uh, three types. Let's, so let's put this up here, thermodynamic properties. <laughs> and the classifications that we can think of uh, is extensive, intensive, and specific. So extensive, so extensive, um, so when the extent of the system uh, or the amount of mass um, uh, affects the property. So if you double the mass, you double, you, you double this property. Uh, these are called extensive. Depends though, uh, depends on the extensive depends on on the mass uh, extensive property so 
uh, examples are extensive properties. Uh, vol well, volume. Well, yes, volume uh, is an extensive property because if you double the mass, it would, it would everything else would remain equal. You would double the amount of volume that it would need to for the mass to be there. Um, so volume certainly. So an example would be just put that in there. We'll, put, we'll fill this in in a minute, but let's just put that one. That's what we've met. Another one is, in fact, energy. Energy uh, again. You know, if you if you imagine energy in mechanical terms as the energy of all the particles, clearly then if you put twice as many particles, you've got more energy. So energy is another example there of an extensive uh, property. Uh, it turns out entropy as well. Uh, let's do the one which, uh, anyways, we haven't talked about entropy yet, but we mentioned it earlier on. <laughs> uh, there's others, there's loads of them. Um, intensive is the other definition. An intensive, uh, independent then of the mass, independent. Independent of the mass, independent of mass. Uh, examples of that, uh, well, we met some already. So pressure, I think we would accept that was intensive. Pressure. I mean, if you double the mass, it makes no difference as far as the pressure is concerned. Uh, for a uniform uh, uh, system. Uh, temperature, that's not going to be effective, is it? Temperature. Uh, and there's, there's, lots, there's lots of others, uh, we'll fill them in. Uh, so they're two important ones. And the third category is specific, specific. A specific property. Uh, now this is got about by uh, taking your extensive property And dividing through by the mass of the system. So you look at your system, whatever the uh, extensive property is, which could be uh, volume, for instance, um, or energy, for instance, entropy, and uh, you divide through by the mass and you've got specific, which makes it an intensive uh, property. So this is a, a subclass of intensive, if you like. Because if you've got an extensive property, so the you know if the mass doubles, it doubles on both top and bottom here. The effect of it, uh, so it cancels out. So then, it, therefore, specific is independent of the mass. Uh, so what we find is, and we can usually you know little. I tend to use little lowercase symbols. So the volume divided by the mass. So V is volume here, M is mass. So a specific volume would be would be one. So let's uh, so specific. We, we tend we tend to just cut whatever it is. We tend to just put specific in front of it. So specific volume. Uh, that one. Then we've got energy. So little u, for instance, could be big u divided by the mass. Specific energy. As I say, uh, an entropy a bit less. Is equal to big S divided by the mass entropy. And there's lots of others, lots of others that we can think of. We'll meet them on the course as we as we get on. Um, so these are thermodynamic properties, we can just subdivide them again. Uh, it's useful to know which ones are being affected by this extent of the system uh, and which ones uh, are not. Um, so that's property. In, very, in fairly broad terms, it's not a precise definition. I'm going to give you a precise definition in a moment. Uh, but before I do that, I want to do the last set of definitions, which is state. So let's get rid of this. <laughs> so, again, these all apply to your system, of course. We start off with a system, and then we look at the properties of our system. Um, and we're imagining, and I've got to say, uh, what we're imagining in all this is... Um, it, well, it's essentially equilibrium thermodynamics, where these things are definable. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the, the system, you know, if you disturb a system, 
of a gas or something and do it very rapidly, then you'll find the uh, pressures and such like and temperatures will, will not be uniform in that system. It will vary a little. But after a while, it will settle down and you'll have a nice uniform temperature, a nice uniform uh, pressure. Uh, and that's, a, that's essentially a, an equilibrium. Um, and that's pre principally what we're going to be doing on the, on the course, on the first part of the course, is we're looking at equilibrium thermodynamics. So the next thing I want to talk about uh, is state. State of a system. So it's related to the properties. A state of a system is a complete description uh, of the properties of the system. So let's say that. A state of a system is a complete description of the properties of the properties of the overall system. <laughs> so so if we know all the properties, we know all the values of the property, then we know the state. Uh, and a few things that attach to state, we have a thing called the state space, um, where we imagine that there's lots of properties. Uh, and if we vary the properties in particular ways, then we get different, uh, different, different definitions of what the state is. Uh, and usually we, we tend to do it on a 2D diagram. Uh, so what we tend to do is that, uh, for instance, I could have P and I could have V, just as an example. And on this diagram, we might have a particular value of P, a particular value of V, v and that would be the state of the system. Um, and we call this a state point. So a state point on this, in the state pace, this is a state diagram. So let's, a few words, that's all. This is a state diagram. These uh, assumed that the properties are independent here. Yeah, so these are uh, the PV. Uh, uh, we imagine here uh, that these are independent properties. We have the freedom to to, to essentially change them, if you like. Uh, independently of one another. Uh, so we have a, a, and what we, this, a point on this diagram, of course, could refer to my system. When I was talking to, does refer to my system, but when I was talking about my piston and my gas, so what we're imagining, you know, in, the, in this system, oops, that's not a very good diagram, in this system uh, of, of gas there, then we'd have a certain pressure and we'd have a certain temperature or, or well, volume in this case, pressure and V. So in that system, we would know the pressure and V and that refers on this diagram, which is the point on the diagram. Of course, what I could do, I could uh, put the piston in or bring it out and alter, alter, alter the, uh, the pressure and the, and the volume. And that would cause this thing to uh, to move, of course. You get another set of points. And if you do it slowly, uh, as I say, if this is a, a state point. We imagine this is an equilibrium point. So what I'm imagining is that the, everything's settled down. We've got a nice pressure. It's all uniform across the system. Everything is, uh, you know, settled. Nothing's moving. We can put a point on this. Of course, if I disturb it very rapidly, then uh, I can't draw anything on this thing. I have to wait till it settles down. So I can move, if I like, from one, one, one. I can imagine going from one state to the next through a series of equilibrium points, through a series of state points, uh, which are at an equilibrium. Um, so... And equilibrium thermodynamics is essentially about moving from, um, you know, one equilibrium point to the next. So these are slightly slow moving pr uh, processes. So this is equilibrium, what we call equilibrium thermodynamics. Let's write that down.
Equilibrium thermodynamics, where we move in the system very slowly indeed, uh, and we're waiting for it to settle down. Uh, um, it's essentially a, what we imagine to be a quasi-static process. Uh, quasi-static processes, in mechanical terms at least, um, uh, move very slowly. Time is not an issue in quasi-static processes. You, you, uh, you're moving from one equilibrium state to the next. This is the, uh, the basic idea. Um, anyways, as this, we can go in all various directions to this, to this point, of course, and this thing we call we call this the path. So if you go through, you can, uh, if you go from one equilibrium state, so let's call it A and B. Uh, so the path it takes, uh, where we can define it in this way, through for a series of equilibrium points, uh, we on the state diagram we call it the path. And if you include the endpoints, we call it a process. So let's say uh, the process, process. Uh, it's identically path plus end, end states. That's the process. So we talk about various processes when we, you know, it might be, uh, uh, you know, it might be an isothermal process or something like that, where it's constant temperature or something like that. We will, uh, and what we're thinking about when we say something like that is that we're going from one uh, state point to another um uh through some path uh, defined by the constraint constant temperature in that particular case uh um so that's the that's the state um so it's just a way of defining all the properties now we have a for the type of systems that we're looking at which we call simple systems uh they depend only on uh two properties so this is not a, it's not a law of this, uh, but we have something called the two property rule. The two property rule. Uh, the state, which means the state of a simple system. Simple system. Is defined by two properties. A lot of people ask me about this. Uh, it's not a law. Uh, usually a simple system is uh, uh, a pure substance tends to be um, uniform, um, which, which uh, uh, so it's a gas. Uh, could, uh, that could that has definitely satisfied the pro ideal gases. For instance, you probably know the ideal gas law. When you think about it, it is a it's telling me uh, what you know are the pressures related to temperature and volume. So that is essentially a true property rule uh, being applied there. So for our simple systems, um, which is mainly all the systems that we're going to be looking on in the first year. Um, uh, where we've got a, a, the composition is uh, uniform um, and single competition, well, single competition, uh, pure substances generally uh, certainly are simple, um, but uh, generally defined by uh, only two properties only, which is quite useful. Uh, what it tends to mean is that we're going to see we've got lots of other properties that we can define. Once you've got two of them, it essentially sets all the rest, which is quite useful. Um, of course, the, the, the rule itself is coming again from the microscopic. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a subject called statistical mechanics is where you can get to grips with where this rule is coming from. Um, but this is a, a rule that we're going to be using quite a lot of, despite the fact uh, it's quite a circle definition in a sense. Simple systems are two satisfy the two property rule. What's a simple system? One that defines it, satisfies that rule. What's it? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's kind of a circle definition a little bit. 
Uh, but that's uh, that's so that's the two property rule. Um, oh yes, and it, uh, one last thing I need to do before I get into the Zeroth law. Uh, we want to um, we want to define um, the um, the uh, the property a bit more uh, a bit more precisely. We said it in broad terms; it was an observational characteristic. Uh, but what we can do now, now we've defined the state. Uh, we can say that a property uh, a property is a quantity a quantity whose change is defined. by the end states and not the path. So this is a this is what we mean by a property. Uh, so once I've defined since I've mentioned what a path is and our state diagram, um, the uh, change uh, property is a quantity whose change is defined by the end states only. And we can see things like volume naturally pick that up, don't they? You can see volume. The volume, uh, so a change in volume clearly depends where, only on the endpoints, is it not? You know, you're going to go from, say, v, VA to VB. Uh, the volume doesn't care how you got there. You can just measure the volume when you get there, yes? So... So that would be defined. That's what we mean by a property. This is sort of, so. This is a very precise definition, um, uh, which, uh, and in mathematical terms, uh, you will have met, I'm sure, in your mathematics course, uh, you met contour integrals and things like that. So in mathematical terms, a property, let's say phi, uh, then if, if I integrate phi between phi one and phi two phi a and phi b i probably should have used uh, then that's just equal to phi 2 minus phi 1 uh, it doesn't depend on the path so if i was integrating a property along a contour in this in the state so along my path here uh, in my state space then uh, the change in that property whatever it is it could be volume here it could be pressure whatever it is so if there's volume you go from V1 to V2. Uh, and if I just change, I go on, let's make these one and two then. Uh, so from, from in, a, in our state space, that's what we're thinking about. So if we integrate uh, between uh, endpoint one, endpoint two. Uh, the difference, the change then, uh, is just given by the difference. Uh, so it doesn't depend on, and I'm sure when you looked at your contour integrals, there are things that depend on the contour. Uh, but there are these special ones, and this is called an exact differential mathematically. Uh, when you've got this, when it does satisfy this rule, um, but you can. Uh, so, if you've come across that already, then great. Um, but that's the but the property as this particular as this particular will satisfy this particular rule. It doesn't depend on the path. This is the thing. Does not depend on the path. It only depends on the end states. Uh, so that's the. And if you look at all the properties you mentioned, you'll find that that's the case. If you think about energy, you know the energy in the system. You know, um, you know if, you, if you want to, you know, you, it's well defined. Is it not at the end states? Uh, so a change in energy is definitely defined by that. And and similarly, uh, you know, pressure. You know, the pressure couldn't care less about the. But you've done it, you get to the point, you can measure the pressure, it's kind of be naughty, you know, there's a transducer. Clearly, that's another one that doesn't depend on the, the path uh, used. Okay, so let's, so that's just a series of rather crusty definitions, I'm afraid. Uh, nothing much I could do about them. We've got them out the road. Uh, you can read more about them in the handbook, as a, you know, I've just gone through it fairly quickly. I'm expecting us to do that. Uh, but let's get on to let's get on to the zero law. So this is the bit I want to get to today. Um, 
So we want to get to the zero floor, which, as I mentioned earlier, introduces the, um, the property temperature. <laughs> and it's very straightforward law. Some people think it should be a law. I've heard that argument. Uh, but in fact, you know, it, it, temperature is an important property in thermodynamics, so we have to find a way to define it. Uh, so uh, myself feel it definitely needs to be there. So the zero flow, let's have a... Now I mentioned that the type of thermodynamics we're looking at at the moment is equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, but let's just have a look at mechanical equilibrium for a moment. Uh, and imagine a very simple case. Let's imagine a seesaw. And let's consider this, this, this is my seesaw. Uh, very good. Oh, let's give it a thickness then. So there's my seesaw. And I've got a weight here uh, on this side. Uh, there we go. A little ring there. And a similar weight on this side. Call this A. Call this B. Uh, and let's imagine we're in a situation where the seesaw balances, okay? The seesaw is balancing. Um, and let's consider another seesaw. We did not have to do the same one. Let's do a bit longer, maybe. And let's imagine that we take our weight B, take the weight B and, uh, put, it, and put it on another seesaw. And we've got another weight C. And in each of these cases, we uh, have got it's found to balance. Uh, and the question is, what what can we say about the relationship between A and B? Uh, well, probably straight away you are going to say, "Oh yes, we know what this is. Uh, the weight is the same. The weight is the same. Uh, we can deduce, even though A and B are not in contact. We've done this experiment. Who knows where?" We've done this experiment somewhere else. Uh, so there's, there's no way of transmit, some transmitting information. Um, and we can see that then the weight of C and the weight of A is equal. We could also perform this on the moon, uh, where the gravity is slightly different. Uh, and we could deduce that, well, it's not really the weight then, it's the mass. Um, so we can deduce that N M A here, our mass at A is equal to mass of B. Here we can deduce that the mass of B is equal to the mass of C. And consequently, looking, bringing these together, we deduce that the mass of A equals the mass of C. So what we've used here is mechanical equilibrium. To deduce, in fact, there is a property. Uh, it doesn't tell me what mass is. Uh, we know it's mass. Uh, uh, from mechanics studies, uh, but what it's did, what it's telling me though is that there is a property, something peculiar about A and C, which are common. It must have something in common uh, for it to to bear this mechanical equilibrium here. Uh, and, the, and what we suggest, and we name them what what it is, and that is. Uh, uh, the mass, we call it the mass, uh, despite the fact that it's not really telling us much more than that. But of course, once we've got a way uh, of measuring uh, the size of things, we could define particular quantities of mass, uh, and we can we can therefore, uh, you know, give give units of mass, one kilogram maybe, uh, and we can then for if we put two of these, one kilogram on. We, have two, we can find out if a weight is two kilogram heavier than two kilogram or less than. So we can come up with a way of building up a scale. Uh, and that's essentially, you know, how, it, how it's been done. Um, well, certainly in the past anyway, is how we would define things in this way. And we use an equilibrium to do that. So this is a, this is a mechanical equilibrium. Uh, and the other thing I want to look but in thermodynamics, we want to look at something called uh, thermal equilibrium. It's a very similar thing. So let me think about that.
And to do that, to do that, we have to define uh, a couple of things. So I'm going to um, define uh, a diathermal wall. An adiabatic wall. So this a diathermal wall, you can think of that as a sort of perfect conductor. Perfect conductor. Perfect insulator. This is this is all experimental. This is you know these are experimental observations. There's a type of wall. So if I go to system A. And I've got a, a diathermal wall, so let's call that DW, uh, and bring it into contact with system B. Then, uh, after a while, we, what we expect with a, a, a diathermal wall is that um, uh, if, we're, if you know wherever the properties of this system are, uh, there will be an immediate impact on the system. But after a while, uh, so, you know, bring A into contact with B, essentially we bring them into contact with uh, one's effect and the other. But uh, after a while, they'll, they'll reach an equilibrium, which we call thermal equilibrium. So they'll settle down. Um, uh, and this is just observed experimentally, yes. Uh, so we can do the same with, um, we can do the same, we can also, uh, do the same with DW. We can take B uh, and bring it into contact with C, another system. So, uh, well, if it, if it transpires that, right, if we've got bring A into contact with B uh, and we find there is no change, which is this type of situation. And if then I take it B uh, and bring it into contact with another system C and we find, observe, no change, uh, which is this type of situation, then what we can say is that uh, uh, A has thermal equilibrium, is in thermal equilibrium with B. So here we add mechanical equilibrium. Uh, so in this situation, A, so A and B, so A and B here, a and B are in thermal equilibrium. Equilibrium. Uh, and B and C are in thermal equilibrium. So we find that if we did our little experiment and found that we brought these systems together, there was no change, we'd observe no change in them, then uh, we could say that A and B are in thermal equilibrium. Uh, and of course, and the Zerif law is essentially this, uh, the Zerif law says that this, these two conditions imply that, so this implies, implies that A and C are in thermal equilibrium. So that's the Zerif law. Um, <coughs> well, it's saying a little bit more than that, I, I think. You probably can guess uh, from this mechanical example, which I've just rubbed off. Uh, but it's basically saying that it must be that there's something in common. There must A and C must have something in common uh, with, with one another. Uh, and it has a property, that's what it has. It has a property which is common to it. And the property, uh, we give it a name uh, and we define it to be temperature. And we say that, uh, and all this is really saying then, so A and C, A and C have a property in common. 
we name this the name given to this property to this property is temperature so in a nutshell what we're saying here we're saying that the, so we def, we found it that's a property it must have something in common um, and that property is called temperature so all we're really saying here that ta equals tb so the temperature a system a and the temperature of system b is it same and we found also that tb is equal to tc and no surprise then you know this transitive property which it is is telling me that ta is equal to tc and this is essentially what the set of the law is uh, well it's basically saying you know thermal equilibrium of these two thermal equilibrium of these two implies that thermal equilibrium of those systems which are not in contact and the reason it is of course is that the we've got something in common that thing that's in common is the temperature uh, of the system uh, which is, you know, it's, it's a very simple rule. <laughs> but this is what the Zarif law is uh, in a nutshell. Uh, so uh, there we are. I mean, you can you can wrap it up as uh, the red, we can actually wrap it up as A, and we've got a da, um, where we've got a, uh, um, yes, we've got a, uh, we can have A and uh, C, uh, well, let's draw this a little bit better, but there we are, and you can have a ball there if you like. So this is a diathermal ball, DW. Uh, no, 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 no. Adiabatic wall, AW. Uh, and this is a diathermal wall. Um, and let's put our systems uh, B there. This is a single, you can do it in a single diagram. Uh, basically saying that A and C have no contact with one another, so this is... Uh, adiabatic wall where uh, we can see you've got there's no contact there's, uh, between those two A is in contact with B through the di uh, diathermal wall and C is in contact with B through the diathermal wall and essentially it means that A is in contact with C uh, is, and the temperatures are all the same uh, so this is what we've got this is this is using our adiabatic wall which I didn't in fact use uh, as, as part of this uh, this definition but it's a very simple idea yes very simple idea mechanically equilibrium we found we got to mass uh, and same idea thermal equilibrium we've uh, we've we found that uh, we've got to temperature and we use an equilibrium just to define the property which is the um, which is the the key point okay i've more i think i've done what i want to do in this session we've essentially defined a lot of things uh, system we defined we defined the properties which in a sense a lot of us are probably familiar with pressure this type of thing temperature um, uh, and we define the state of a system uh, if you know the properties you know the values for the properties then uh, you know what the state is uh, we imagine things in equilibrium we imagine you know equilibrium thermodynamics here where things are changing quite slowly uh, but that, that allows us, if you like, to define things uh, for a system. We can give it a single temperature and we can give it a single pressure for your system. Uh, if that's, you know, if the temperatures are varying across the system, then it's, it's not an equilibrium. Um, and thermal equilibrium then uh, is, uh, is, in the sense, this is what this is saying, that, you know, when things are settled down, uh, they, they have a single value, a single temperature, which we, uh, which we can mind so i think that's as much as i want to say for this session so i'll say goodbye and i'll um, uh, see you next time